Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Christ Presbyterian Church. Friends, members, visitors, near and far, we're glad you're here today. I'm here to bring you a word about wind and water, earth and fire. These are elements or energies that people all over the world have um, contemplated and all throughout time. So why are we attracted to flowing water? Why do children splash in rain puddles? And how do you feel when you're on the top of the mountain or you are riding your bicycle down a hill with the wind in your face? Do you feel free, joyful? Or let's say you're gathered around a campfire with others and it's nighttime, or you're staring into the candle flame during worship. Do you feel loved? Or imagine you are essentially hugging the earth, maybe lying on your back on a sandy beach, sitting on the soft grass, or digging your fingers into the warm soil of the garden. You feel connected. So our senses and our bodies are telling us we belong to Mother Earth. And in communion with all living things, and best of all, in a constant dialogue between creation, which is all around us, and the Creator who is in us and also all around us. So let's affirm that in our call to worship today. This is taken from Psalm 96, and this is the message. Sing God a brand new song. Earth and everyone in it, sing. Sing to God, worship God. Let's hear it from sky with earth joining in and a huge round of applause from sea. Let wilderness turn cartwheels. Animals, come dance. Put every tree of the forest in the choir. An extravaganza before God, as God comes to set everything right on earth. Set everything right. Treat everyone fair. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know me by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, awestruck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. Some of our most simple routine action impact God creation around the world, often contributing to environment degradation, hunger, poverty, and chronic illness. As we'll be marking Earth Day this week, let us acknowledge how we have broken that harmony with God and His creation. We have failed in our responsibility of taking care of our earthly home and caring for each other. So let us humbly come before God at this time to confess our sins, all together first and then in the silence of our hearts. Holy God, creator of heaven and earth, we confess that we have not been faithful steward of your creation. We and previous generations of humanity have neglected to take good care of all that you have entrusted to us. By our actions, we have polluted your beautiful creation, the water, the soil, the air, and the whole environment are not the way you meant them to be. In our selfishness, we rush to our amass resources and keep them from others, neglecting the poor and the hungry, discriminating against our fellow human beings, ignoring the cries of the oppressed, and going along with injustice. The damage our actions cause to your creation hurts humanity and condemns billions of your children in the cycle of poverty. Have mercy on us and grant us your forgiveness. As we repent, help us to find wisdom to change our ways and become true steward of your creation. Grant us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new so that we can use our gifts to care for each other and our earth. Amen. Hear the assurance of pardon. Psalm 103 teaches us that God does not treat us as our sin deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heaven are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
Friends, may the joy that comes from singing God's praises fill your hearts and your homes with Christ's peace today. May the peace of Christ be with you. And please take a moment to share Christ's peace with those who are near or far. Good morning. Welcome to News of the Church. This is a good opportunity to be reminded that we continue to be a community centered in Christ, gathering in love, growing by grace, and going forth to serve. For the news this week, I thought I would just scroll through the Wednesday email since that's where most of the information we need to know about lives. And Cindy gives it a fun title every week. This week is CPC is Buzzing. And as I scroll down, the first thing I see is upcoming opportunities to connect with Pastor Jessica. She's really hoping to connect with each one of us in her first few months. So if you haven't done so yet, please sign up for one of those opportunities to get together with her so you can start to know her and she can start to put a name and a face and figure out who we are. Next thing I see is uh, an announcement about Faith Cafe. We've got a great series this semester aligning with the DNA of the church, studies and acts. Uh, I'd encourage you to make an hour on Wednesday evenings to join us for that. Continue to scroll down. I see that we're having a Centering Prayer Introductory Workshop that's coming up on the 24th. And there's an open letter from Norma Madsen talking to us as a church about how um, instrumental and transformational centering prayer has been in her life. So I'd encourage you to take a read at that letter and to really consider joining us for that Saturday morning. Uh, so many people I know and respect, this is a central part of their spiritual practice and being, so that would be a good one to consider. And also, there's a notice about uh, outdoor book discussions for each month, May through August. We will be having book discussions in the park behind the church outside on a Saturday morning. So this is a reminder to me that I need to order the first book and get started reading it. So there's a number of other things in here. Please do um, scroll all the way down through the Wednesday emails loaded with lots of good information. I'd also like to remind us this morning that underneath the screen that you're watching where there's a number of links that you could click, there's one for a friendship pad or the friendship notebook that we used to pass when we gathered in person. And I'd encourage 
each of us to take a minute during the service and click on that link and fill out any information. It's an opportunity also to update us with prayer requests and things um, of that nature. Lastly, I'd like to just mention that each month we have a highlight from one of our Learn and Serve mission partners. And today we have the opportunity to hear from our friends and partners in Alexandria, Egypt, with the ministry at Fairhaven School. So let's give these guys a good listen and then remember throughout the week to be in prayer for them. Have a good week, church. Greetings. As many of you know, CPC has been involved with the ministry of Sarai Presbyterian Church in Alexandria, Egypt, and its daughter ministry, Fairhaven School, for about 30 years. Fairhaven School serves students with special needs who range from preschool age to young adult. It was the very first school of its kind in Alexandria, and it's located just down the road from the beautiful Mediterranean Sea. For nearly three decades, we have shared life together, and we have developed deeper friendships. We adjust according to the needs and according to what the times call for. Since October 2020, Zoom gatherings every two weeks have offered us an enriched way for some of us from CPC to join with a small but committed collection of folks who've journeyed alongside Fairhaven through the years. Have we seen each other in Egypt? We gather virtually from Sweden, Egypt, and several U.S. states. A long time ago, yeah. We check in and pray together in multiple languages and learn Fairhaven updates from George, a lay leader at Saray Church, and Dr. Ashraf, the Fairhaven school director. Our discussions often explore additional needs and possibilities for offering support. Here's Dr. Ashraf with a message for our congregation. Hello, CPC in Madison. First, let me offer congratulations on receiving your new senior pastor, Jessica. Ahlan wa sahlan, Pastor Jessica. Welcome. We share your excitement for this new chapter. I want to say thank you to CPC for your long-term support. It's a real blessing to remain connected and be able to support one another in prayer from across the world. This past September, we have reopened its door for classroom instruction after have been closed since March 2020 because of the pandemic. Our staff and most of our students wear masks or face shield. A few of our students are not able to wear mask or face shield, but thankfully none of our students have had COVID, as far as we know. We also limit our classroom to three or four students per room, depending on the level of need. We are inspired by the creativity and love we see here each day. Let's continue praying for one another and let's remain thankful that we can continue to find ways to stand alongside one another from across the globe. Thank you to all of you in advance. Today, we continue a sermon series called Living with the End in Mind. In recent days, we've faced many challenges and changes, and now we're confronted with yet another one. How to put the pieces of life back together in a new way. In scripture, we see that when our ancestors in faith felt a bit lost or fatigued, they looked to God for glimpses of hope and a vision for where they were headed. These visions of God's future helped people live well through their present challenges. Today, we are going to hear a vision from the book of Revelation. Last week, we caught a vision of God's all-encompassing grace and God's call on our lives to extend God's grace to all. But this week, we'll add texture to that vision with this revelation from John, the wild final chapter of the Christian Bible. This selection that we'll hear today paints a picture of an extreme earth makeover. 
So let's listen for how the Spirit brings to life yet more of the joy and promise of living with God's end in mind. Today's scripture readings come from the book of Revelation in the New Revised Standard Version. Please listen for the word of God. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them. They will be God's people. And God himself will be with them. God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. For the first things have passed away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was 10, one of my friends dropped a bombshell on our lunch conversation. She said, one day, if I don't come back to lunch, don't be surprised. We all said, are you moving? And she said, well, kind of. One day, we're going to be driving to school, and then my mom is going to disappear, and then my dad is going to disappear, and then I'm going to disappear. I don't know about my brother. What are you talking about, we said. Why would you disappear? Why wouldn't your brother disappear with you if both you and your mom and your dad were too? And she said, well, because we're going to get ruptured, but he's going to get left behind. I think she meant raptured but I can't be sure. It was about the time that the Left Behind book series came out and swept the country into massive conversations about whether or not we're living in the end times and what would happen if we were. Now, it wasn't a new conversation, but you have to wonder a little bit about what was going on when 10-year-olds were dreaming about the day when they could escape this world of trial and trouble. I don't hear quite as much about all that right now. Most of us can still hardly leave our houses, let alone this earth. But wow, do we still long to escape so many of the traps of our human limitations. With the trial of Derek Chauvin still going on, we witness the death of Dante Wright. With vaccines rolling out for some, thousands of others continue to get sick. Even as spring soaks up early beauty and brings flowers from the earth, we know the earth is warming and that climate change is a train that could come off the rails at any time. Is it all inevitable? death and doom and destruction? That's certainly one picture of the end of the world. You may have heard that Revelation foretells of a battle of Armageddon, that the forces of God and evil would have a showdown there, and it would be more gory than any R-rated war movie, and at the end of it, there would have been so many prior wars through the earth that this whole planet would just be rubble and ruin uninhabitable for human life or anything else for that matter. And God would rapture out all of the faithful believers and take them away to a far heavenly place. That's one picture of where this world might be headed. But interestingly, the vision from Revelation that we read suggests something quite different about where this world is headed and what might be possible with God in the meantime. Let's pause for a moment and explore what the book of Revelation is. Who wrote it? 
Where did it come from? And what might God have been up to when God gave this vision to John? Revelation was written by a man named John who received a vision from God while living on the Greek island of Patmos. You see, John had been forcibly removed from his home and was being held captive by Roman authorities. John lived during the reign of Roman Emperor Domitian. And by that time, the Roman Empire had colonized nearly the entire Mediterranean world. People whose identities had once been defined by their town of a hundred people who spoke the language of their birth and worshiped the God of their ancestors. Well, these people were told that they were now Roman and had to send their prophets to an emperor from a city they'd never seen to help with an effort to colonize people who lived in parts of the world they didn't even know existed. Now, some people, some Jewish and Christian people even, resisted these demands. They tried to take back leadership of their local provinces. And as you can imagine, that elicited dramatic responses from local Roman governors and military leaders. The Romans destroyed ancient temples, expelled Jewish and Christian people from their homes, and even invited people to tell on their neighbors. They'd say, if you know someone who refuses to call Emperor Domitian Lord and God, but calls on the name of someone else as Lord and God, you could tell us. And then those people would face captivity and even death. It was an entire system of threat and domination with Domitian at the helm, and there was no escaping. For many, the only viable way of life seemed to be to accept this way of life and to make do with the world as it had become, no matter how bad things got. But John, John had a lot of time to think and pray. From a little cave on a little cove on a beautiful sea island, he watched the tide come and go, Storms passed over and then revealed clear skies. And John recalled the vision of Genesis, where the Spirit of God hovered over chaotic waters and created a new order to things and brought forth life out of what seemed like just nothing. Day by day, the voice of God revealed to John a vision we call Revelation. And he wrote, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, a new creation. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. See, the home of God is among mortals hovering over these chaotic waters. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. There was no escaping this earth and all its problems. But there was actually something better. The promise that this earth would once again be inhabitable, humane, healing, a home for people and for God to dwell together in peace. This vision of an extreme earth makeover is very different than the vision my friend shared with me at that elementary school lunch table. So if we're not going to get plucked out of this world now or later, then the stuff of this world, good, bad, beauty, pain, whether we eat Lunchables packed in plastic or cafeteria peas, it all matters somehow. The fate of every person matters. Even the brother my friend thought she could escape. So if God is at work on this extreme earth makeover, what does this mean for us? What difference does it make living with this end in mind? Well, while the vision John received didn't include an immediate end to suffering, you've likely heard of the violent supernatural scenes of Revelation that include beasts and dragons and swords and flames of fire. While the suffering doesn't end immediately, it is a word of hope. God's promise to dwell with us and make this earth a hospitable home for all helps us see destructive forces for what they are and remain committed to the things of God that make for life. 
John writes, this is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. In a world that often seems inhospitable to life, the lives of black people, Asian people, LGBTQ people, people who live with disabilities, people who live near disappearing water sources. In this kind of world, God says, keep the commandments of the creator God, hold fast to the faith of Jesus, and sow seeds of life. Octavia Butler is one such person whose seed sowing continues to bear fruit in a generation she never met. Butler died in 2006, but left a body of literature gathering ever more acclaim. Butler was raised as a Baptist in Pasadena, Pasadena, California. Her father died when she was young. Her mom raised her while working as a house cleaner for white families. Butler was black. As a child, Butler devoured science fiction and at 11 years old wrote her own. As a young adult, Butler looked out over our country's mid-century civil rights struggles and environmental movements and was moved to make her own mark on it. Some have called her writing science fiction, others Afrofuturism. Some call her a prophet, others recoil at the visions she cast in the parable of the sower. It was a dystopian vision of America circa 2020 where climate change causes great migrations and racial divisions lead to a never-ending spiral of death. But when 2020 came, and it was filled with pandemic and racial injustice and climate change disasters, interestingly, more people than ever read Butler's visions. People played songs and wrote plays based on Butler's work. Butler's quotes even appeared in the entrances to Trader Joe's. You see, in the parable of the sower, there is this horror of a dystopian nightmare. But there is also the incredible story of a young woman, a climate change refugee, Lauren, who endures. Lauren's life is defined by daily encounters with death. Armed people threaten to take each other's food. Others threaten and harass her little traveling band because it is of mixed race. But along her journey, Lauren receives a vision for a new future, the start of a new religion, a new spirituality called Earthseed. And Butler gives readers such visions as a young woman standing boldly before a fire, with not rain falling from the sky, but acorns. Sarah Thompson, a Denver high school teacher, marveled at the work of art that one of her students made after reading Butler's book. And Sarah wrote this, what does it mean for rain to be replaced with acorns? Acorns can't put out the fire that rages behind Lauren in this painting. An acorn doesn't promise relief from emergency. But each acorn does contain a dormant future a promise of possibility. So she asks, what if we could seek not only to put out fires, but to plant trees, to care not only for the necessary immediate relief, but for future relief, from hunger, from air pollution, from violence, from racism, from a treeless horizon. Through the story of Lauren, Butler invites us to turn away from the original human sin of seeking to dominate one another and the earth and toward a saving way of providing for one another, politically, civically, and personally, for the long haul. So I wonder, in these days, when we have an opportunity to pause and to begin living in a new way with the end in mind, what seeds do we wish to plant with God? And how do we work with God and each other to create the conditions for their flourishing? This week, I heard members of the Christ Presbyterian Church congregation reflect that in the wake of Dante Wright's death, they were feeling called to extend empathy, but they were also feeling called to support people who are planting seeds for an anti-racist society. 
I also learned this week that other CPC members, out of their longing to join God in planting seeds for a healthier planet, they've created an environmental justice team. And one of the first things they're doing is in attending this online Earth Day conference hosted by the University of Madison, and they've invited all of us to join them. I took a look at the lineup, and whether you are moved by biology, technology, art, history, racial justice, recreation, water, health, or business, there are incredible things planned for this coming Thursday and Friday. And there's more information online about how to register. Perhaps if you have children in your life, you'd consider bringing them to the CPC Children and Family Earth Day to help the city clean up Giddings Park. It's important to keep it clean and beautiful for the hundreds of people who gather in, on the lakeside in front of our church building. But it's equally essential to give our children and ourselves opportunities to be shaped by the physical and spiritual act of caring for God's creation. And the good news is that whenever we plant seeds, whether in human hearts or in the earth below, God will make the provisional work of our hands ultimately fruitful in one extreme earth makeover. For you see, the home of God is among mortals, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, one with no more crying, no more pain, not even the creation groaning in labor pains as it labors with us for this new life. So let us live with hope and plant seeds of hope with this end in mind. Amen.
Would you join me in prayer? Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Grant us peace. For the unbearable toil of our sinful world, we plead for remission. For the terror of absence from our beloved, we plead for your comfort. For the scandalous presence of death in your creation, we plead for the resurrection. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Grant us peace. God, we ask for the sending of your healing spirit, who came to us through Jesus as he breathed on his disciples. The spirit gathered your people to be warmed by the fire of your divine presence. By this warmth, may your creation be healed and taken into your care. Come, Holy Spirit, and heal all that is broken in our lives, in our streets, on this land, and in our world. For we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. As we end our time in worship together today, I want to remind you to sign up for one of the 10-person gatherings with me, either this week or in one of the weeks to follow. I would love to meet every single person in the Christ Pres family and community. So go online, there's still time to sign up, invite a friend, and you can join us either in person or by Zoom. I really look forward to seeing you soon. And now as you go, may you remember that God dwells among you. God dwells among us in our homes, in our city, throughout this beautiful creation. 
May you go trusting that God is there first and that God will give you everything you need to be at peace. All thanks be to God. Amen.